That's to get a little comedy, a little <laughs> organic in it. Like, okay, you guys are on. You know, put that silly part in there. I would keep it. It's still going. So, you know. <laughs> All right. Three, two. Hi, my name is Kenya Vera Sample, and I am a proud Chicagoan. I've been a part of Chicago all of my life. Uh, my family has probably been in Chicago since about 1880. Um, I think that that foundation for me is really one of the greatest reasons why I'm so committed uh, to development and impacting my community in a positive way. And I have my lovely husband here, Julian. Uh, Julian Sample, native 44, native Chicagoan on the south side, grew up in Morgan Park. Uh, had relatives, uh, my, actually my mother's sister, my aunt, um, lives, lives not too far from here still to this day. I uh, spent a lot of time in Inglewood growing up with aunts, uncles, and cousins. Uh, always had an attachment uh, to agriculture growing up by way of my parents who were both from Mississippi. Um, got engaged in agriculture here with my wife after we had children and were concerned about uh, providing the best quality of food that we could to them as they were growing up. Uh, we find ourselves involved in urban agriculture now and this specific project on the trail uh, in the process of developing sustainable, viable businesses that will eventually provide benefit to the residents of England. Uh, that's our focus. Uh, we're committed to thinking about agriculture out of, outside of the box. Uh, traditionally, you may think of greens, tomatoes, so forth, but our specific ap application is through the use of elderberries, and we're developing an elder elderberry wine. Excellent. So, can you talk about that business? What is that called? Um, and why elderberries? And what is the, the value in that for you all? Well, um, for us, um, our business. It's called uh, Dusabo City Ancestral Winery and Vineyards. And um, this has been about a 10 year process. I think Julia and I both uh, grew up uh, with a great affinity for nature, a connection to nature, um, to our planet. So upon you know us really having children, we were looking for ways to um, engage our children out in nature, give them fresh air, um, really reconnect them in so many ways. And out of that reconnection about 10 years ago, um, we started blossoming uh, into other avenues of developing an agricultural curriculum, uh, going into developing uh, food kinds of items and, and food demonstrations. I mean, there's so many gaps and with gaps are so many opportunities. We started just to start feeling and researching some of the gaps that we found in the food system that could really, um, really bring about a, a lot of change in our community where we have healthier communities. We have healthier um, uh, economic enterprises within our community. Uh, we have a healthier education and, and refocusing, um, you know, so many benefits uh, in all of that process. So what had happened was, um, through our research, we looked at several varieties of um, different things. We first, we kind of started off as simple as uh, dandelion. We started uh, researching and found that dandelion root actually is uh, valued at anywhere from 20 to almost $60 a pound. And we said, wow, there's really a lot of opportunity for economic enterprising uh, and development. So we looked at um, mushrooms, we looked at aquaponics, we looked at um, all kinds of different things that are just around us and abundant that we can now transform into a business. A couple of years ago, Julian 
and uh, one of his high school friends, we decided that we were going to do um, a business for the African Festival of the Arts in which we designed garden pizzas. And out of those garden pizzas, we really um, found that uh, people really wanted to see uh, healthier options. They wanted to see something local. They wanted to see uh, people within the community uh, bringing about economic uh, development and new uh, innovative creative ways to make money. So, so I'd just like to add to that. Uh, our focus really has been how to uh, develop a short list of viable businesses that can be applied in the urban setting, you know, in black folks' neighborhoods. So, you know, we have traditionally issues with vacant lots in our areas, and we consider them to be resources that can be developed into an economic benefit for our people. So, as Kenya was mentioning, she gave a few examples. Uh, we considered many of those examples and found ourselves here with the wine. We said why elderberry. Elderberry is a native plant. Uh, once you plant it, it lasts about 50, 60 years. Uh, it doesn't require a lot of labor and maintenance during the spring and summer seasons. And it's one of the highest quality um, medicinal berries on earth. So you can, Kenya came up with the phrase, uh, where well, you're really drinking to your health, you know? if you're drinking a form of wine that also has a, a healthy substitute for a grape that's, uh, that makes up the drink itself. So I would add to that is that um, we were looking at all these different value-added products. We were looking at how much is red clover that's abundant and through the whole city, it grows everywhere. How much is that a pound? How much is dandelion? Uh, what is the ability to import? We even looked at, uh, at one time we actually had Moringa coming in from Jamaica um, just to make a connection with the farmers globally. Um, so we really wanted to think of everything sustainably. So in that sustainable thought, we realized that elderberry being a native plant had a, and not just a native plant, but also being one of the um, best known, if not the best antibacterials on the uh, viral, um, antivirals uh, on the planet. So once we got to the place where we decided that we wanted to do elderberry, we started looking at other markets. We noticed that um, Chicago is the second largest consumer of wine in the country, second only to California. We have a billion dollar wine industry here in Chicago, but we're not really at the scale and capacity of using uh, the land that once was used to grow vineyards, uh, grapes, and fruits is now kind of um, really dwindled down greatly by probably maybe 10% of what it might have been in, uh, say, 1920 when we were using probably a lot more land for this development. Um, so we said, hey, um, we have a great opportunity to do a healthy um, variety of wine. Uh, we wanted to do something that was really world class. So the sparkling uh, champagne or champagne method of wine really was appealing to us because it really filled the gap of an industry in which we have um, the second largest consumers here in the city of Chicago. We can now uh, meet that market and when meeting that market we're able to really ex uh, explore and really kind of um, spread the wealth and exploit the other resources and um, vintners and uh, wineries and vineyards that are all through Illinois and the Midwest. How do we connect to those things? I know you're gonna edit this out, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. Okay. So, so that's great. I mean, it's it's, it's not just something that um, it's kind of come out of a small business workshop 
but you know yesterday <laughs> uh, but it's kind of this evolution and ongoing process for you all um, can you all talk about what that's been like in Chicago you know um, coming you know the this the being black social entrepreneurs um, and, and any advice that you have for folks who want to do that kind of work and also um, where GGE kind of comes into the mix when you met how did that connection happen and what that support has looked like these past couple of years well we started in 2008 with urban agriculture uh, I think we met Anton Seals maybe that first year um, he came by to our garden in Morgan Park asked us some background questions on how we kind of pulled it all together uh, we were able to give him you know solid advice and I would say about uh, four, four years later, Anton approached us, which is, uh, I think he's the president of GGE. He exactly approached us director. with uh, this opportunity to participate in the development of this nature trail. Um, and accompanying the nature trail is the development of agricultural businesses that will uh, border the trail along a 1.7 mile stretch. Um, Remind me of what, what, what the process has been for us. Um, I, I, the process for us has been one that of a, a lot of learning, um, a process of where we're able to bring great integrity um, to to business. You know, um, we we want to we really want to. Uh, reduce these uh, vacant lots that do nothing in our community. We want to now see businesses that are not exploiting our community but find meaningful ways to give back and contribute. So for us this is, has been you know a, a, a life-changing um, endeavor. Thank you. It's been a life-changing endeavor for us in which um, it's hard for me to come up with any negative um, things that have held us back, any negative experiences. We really, we really haven't had those kind of things. Everything has been um, very open for us. People have been very receptive. Yes, we have our challenges. Um, it's been a lot of work. I know one, um, some of the work that you might um, not see us do, but I can remember one night um, we were in London Town. Um, London Town Homes uh, allowed us to plant gardens there for several years. And in an effort to really garner the support of the community, we went out um, at night, it, in, it was below zero, and we passed out 400 flyers. So, uh, door it, that door to door. And I'd say, you know, those are the challenges where, you know, you really have to dig in deep. Um, <clears throat> Often time with this program, and, and I say this a lot, um, is I think the biggest lesson that I've learned, and I kind of take a note from Buddha, where he says that it is not our duty to be extraordinary, but what we want to do is we want extraordinary to so the philosophy that Buddha says is that it is not to be extraordinary but when extraordinary is very ordinary and what we take away from that is that we all we all have our everyday challenges that we face but in those challenges there is still opportunity for us to give back and I think that's what Julian and I have really been about that we're just like regular everyday people but we saw that no matter with all of our problems that we still can put some of those things aside and be able to give back to our community be able to impact our community be able to be innovative creative and share with our community with little to nothing you know just an abandoned vacant lot now has turned into a 10-year project that affords us a position to now put a business plan and proposal to the city for the city for a vineyard. I wanted to add a few comments. So 
I, I really want to be honest about the challenges over the last two years. As she mentioned, we're average people. And, you know, when you're doing kind of uh, social work uh, on your own, sometimes it can be challenging from an economic perspective. And we've gone through that. In addition to that, when you consider the landscape of urban agriculture, there's not many examples of profitable businesses that have been birthed out of that, that movement. And I think that has been disappointing to many black people who have been past participants. So I think it's really uh, a great responsibility is on us to really drive forward uh, the whole idea to black people that you really if you're involved in this thing, you really have to be focused on really looking outside of the norm of what everybody else is doing. Uh, once you find a good niche, <clears throat> and a good niche will be a product that you develop, hopefully a value-added product, there are some raw products that fit this model too, that you get a good return off the product. And you know, on that profit, you'll be able to pay yourself and your workers very well. And I think if we create those type of businesses, we can really kind of galvanize a movement amongst our people of uh, strong interest once they really see that they really can get something out of it that can change their lives. So that's where our focus is. The winery is the first one. We have about five or six others that we want to get to. I think that once we demonstrate first and are able to you know, generate some finances, that will empower us to even do more in the future. Absolutely. No, I think that's excellent. Last last piece, um, talk about the event you have coming up and you know, any way you want to promote it, what is that about? How big is it for you to have this event coming up and, and what was GGE's role in helping to support yeah, that? Yeah, the GGE role. Uh, I really, there's so many thousands of things that run through my mind and heart that are so favorable about working with GGE, Grow Greater Inglewood. Um, the executive director is Anton Seals. Um, he has been our mentor for the past several years um, in grooming us and really pulling out um, the ideas uh, uh, and really connecting those ideas to what the community needs are and all, all in that being mindful of what the planet needs. So um, he's an instrumental uh, person um, with a great insight and um, he understands the big picture and the big scope of what really needs to happen. Um, which, you know, you need people like that in, in positions of leadership that um, can really see the uh, uh, value of each person and identify a place for them to really take their value and appreciate that value. Um, so, you know, we, we have a great amount of respect and admiration for Anton. We've learned a lot in this process. Um, about what it really requires for us uh, in our community to be ready and open for when big projects come to your door. What does that work really take? What does it, you know, what is required? Um, you know, what are the skills that you need? What are the resources that you need? He's been fundamental in bringing uh, 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 Tara uh, Johnson of Tara's Way to the project so that we could understand the big side of business and what that really looks like as we transition and we're working towards the big business. Um, what does it look like to be a person uh, as Tara Johnson of Tara Ways? She raised 14 million dollars of her own money and um, she raised 14 million dollars to support her project and Anton bringing her on board um, was really a game changer for us because what I realized that if she could <laughs> work so hard to make 14 million dollars for her company that I, I took the challenge for myself and that's why Julian and I are <clears throat> trying to as much as they say 
we're trying to put as much skin of, of our own skin in the game. We're, we have been very reluctant about being a non-for-profit business um, because uh, we know that, that there's great uh, avenues for non-for-profit, but we do need to see a transition and a movement of our community into more for-profit businesses. So that was kind of the whole uh, idea for us to not just do a non-for-profit, but do a for-profit for, uh, for business that would bring um, a economic transformation to the entire community where we could really employ people, give them a different scope of skill sets in viticulture and enology. Um, we also uh, understood that we would have to be raising a lot of money of, on our own that we can't just expect people to, to give us money because we have this brilliant idea. So with that, uh, Julian and I have gotten to work. Uh, we've uh, sought out anchors within our community to align ourselves. Uh, recently, we spoke with Kimbark Liquors, uh, Brian Duncan. He also um, is a restaurateur, um, one of his uh, notable restaurants. Uh, out of the five that he had at one time downtown was Ben 36. So we had an opportunity to go buy Kimbark Liquors. We wanted to really uh, see what the authorities in the industry of wine would say about our wine. And Brian, he absolutely loved the wine. So for us that was the kind of confirmation that we need to know that we're on the right path with this. We have someone who has many, many years of expertise in this to say that he loved our wine, absolutely loved it, and that he's willing to support what we're doing. So we're trying to reach out again, make sure that we are doing the work, put, putting in the legwork ourselves, raising as much money as we can ourselves, and um, <clears throat> with that, we have an event coming up, which is going to be August 9th. DuSable City Ancestral Winery will be hosting our first fundraiser. From 6 to 12. From 6 to 12 p.m. Uh, we will have a featured in-house guest winemaker, Cicely McLennan, who will be uh, who will be hosting, featuring her Tej Ethiopian honey mead, along with an orange blossom wine, a pineapple beer, and of course a few bottles of our elderberry champagne method. Um, sparkling wine will be available for auction. So yeah, it's gonna be a good time. We're gonna have music, food, uh, some of our T-shirts be able to taste all the offerings. Yeah, so we're going to do like an Ethiopian themed barbecue with nice. roasting coffee and frankincense in the air and the music and the ambiance. And we just want to have a really good experiential um, organic spill in the street or old school house party. For sure. Where is it at? It's going to be at 11126 South Sangamon. In Chicago, on the Illinois, south side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Excellent. <laughs> Thank you all so much. This has been great. Um, you all definitely embody not just um, you know what it takes to be successful business, but um, are also inspiring in terms of you know a beautiful black love right and the value of black love and black love that can create and that can transform into black business is even better right yeah than yeah. just black business mm -hmm. yeah um so i want to extend that to you all thank you um as as, as part of a you know a couple generations down the line mm -hmm. and um as part of you know um someone who's who's in between generations and looking back at a younger generation I'm younger than me and seeing that black love is not as appreciated anymore. Yes, yes. You know, the what you all have and want is something that we have to ask ourselves as a community. Is it something that we value? Yes. 
Well, I, I've been, uh, speaking of black love, I've been giving it a lot of thought and, and I've really been thinking lately that um, if I had to put it into words what this experience with um, having your partner a significant other is nothing less than magical. I have really had the opportunity um, in when as we face the challenges of working together and living together and having so much intertwined that it has really allowed me um, the good fortune of seeing my mate in the most magical of ways. I mean truly magical. Um, you know, we're developing this kind of synchronicity where, you know, we just, we play a good game together. We lobbing each other the ball back and forth. I know when to catch it. He knows when to throw it. I know when to throw it. He knows when to catch it. And I think the work like this, when you can bring one of the most important persons of your life into your work and share that experience, I really don't think that you can find anything better than that. Sure. Come on now, you gotta say something real sexy and fun <laughs> about me. It's true. All right. Well, <clears throat> I think uh, you stole my thunder. Right? What you said. I, I always that's steal what your I have, thunder. I have been saving. But really, honestly, that's just be from the heart. It's nothing better than doing some work for the people, and you have your wife and your husband in that process with you. you know? So it never, never feels like a drag because when it's time to go somewhere and do something, you know, she's just as excited and motivated as I am. So we definitely inspire each other to do more than I think we could sure. by ourselves. Yeah, exactly. I think that's an important thing is that, I, I mean, I've always had a connection to nature. I've always been that kind of green peace, save the planet kind of girl. But having someone share that passion and suddenly so open to incorporate that into their lives is, um, you know, you, that's important. And I think that's what, you know, a good marriage is about the ability to be open, receptive, realizing that you're not just one person anymore. And instead of kind of trying to figure out how to work that out, just focus on the good parts and it kind of falls into place with respect and appreciation. Absolutely. I say. I say. <laughs>